And then I moved out to the Bay Area right after I graduated with effectively like some bottles of liquid and was like, okay, I'm gonna get made and test it out. And I'm gonna do it on a really small scale to truly understand like, you know, what's gonna work? What are people gonna respond well to? And I think that sentiment came from a lot of advice I got from investors, from entrepreneurs that were, you know, all said, hey, if you're gonna carve out a new space, a new category, like, it's challenging and you need to figure out what works before you go in really, really deep. And so launched the product in 2018 and drove it around in my Honda Fit to grocery stores and did the in-store demos and you know did the distribution. And from that process, learned the first product was horrible. <laughs> this is Startup the Storefront, the podcast where we inspire entrepreneurship through truth. Today's guest is Eliza Ganesh, founder of Sunwink. As is often the case in the health and wellness space, the founding of Sunwink came about as a result of a personal issue. Eliza was diagnosed with an autoimmune disease and sought a better way to fight the disease and lead a healthier life. She had to experiment a bit and incorporate feedback from her early customers, but she persevered and eventually found a recipe that succeeded. So then, Armed with little more than some bottles of Sunwink and her Honda Fit, she made her mark in the Bay Area before growing Sunwink into a nationwide brand. So listen in as we cover everything from working in San Francisco through the pandemic and if she intends to keep the Sunwink HQ there long term, the value of knowing your worth as a female entrepreneur, and how learning new TikTok dances fits into her own corporate wellness plan. Hang on, hang on. If you're not subscribed, can you go ahead and do that right now before we get on with the video? Helps us out tremendously. That's all we ask, and we're back. All right, welcome to the podcast, everyone. On today's show, we have Eliza, founder of Sunwink. Thanks so much for joining. Tell everyone a little bit about your company. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. So I'm Eliza Ganesh. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Sunwink. Sunwink is a plant-powered wellness company. So we make awesome, delicious products that are made of superfoods and herbs. And we really believe that everyone should be eating, drinking, consuming herbs, superfoods in, in every meal occasion that they have. So we're, we're here to make it easy. What made you want to start the company? Personally, we're investors in some wellness companies here in Los Angeles. And so We've heard, you know, the whole gamut of why they got started. Sometimes it's really personal. Sometimes it's they're solving a problem for a friend or a family member. What made you want to to start Sunwink? Yeah, it was definitely personal for me. I, I was diagnosed with an autoimmune disease at my last semester of business school. You know, it was a skin condition that caught me pretty unaware and it was really stressful. And I, you know, spent a lot of time going to kind of the doctor's office effectively. And it was really helpful for just, you know, acute treatment, but I felt like what I was going to have to do on the preventative side was going to be longer term. And, and I wasn't super pumped about using really intense things they were giving to me. So my siblings actually, um, an herbalist and they were like, Hey, come to Vermont, like come meet my herbalist friend, you can do an herbal consultation. And I was blown away by not just the plants and the herbs themselves, which, which have been really great allies for me in terms of stress, but um, also just loved the, the whole shape and form of it, right? Like you sit down for an hour and a half with someone and they say, how are you doing? Like holistically, and they really listen. And I just, that energetically was, was amazing. So just was really blown away by the whole space and, and wanted to, to share it with people. You know, like I said, I was at business school. I, I was paying a lot of attention to the food space. Like I had just, I just interned at General Mills and I actually had signed the dotted line to go work at another really big consumer packaged good co goods company. And I actually pulled the offer and was like, I, I really think what is drawing me to this food and beverage and wellness space is very much along the lines of, of what Sunwink became. And so that was that was the kickoff for that journey. That's great. So I started a company when I was in business school and the best thing about it was you're learning, this is how I viewed it. And I'd love to get how you think about it. I learned like the in the box thinking, right? Cause 
in business school, they don't necessarily teach you like, hey, go start a herbal tonic brand, right? That's not what you learned. You learn like this is your accounting, this is your finance, this and some yeah. strategy, which I think the strategy classes are probably like the best strategy negotiations, things like that. But the thing I struggled with was like, okay, I'm trying to start a company, which is so far out of the box. But yeah. in business in general, you there is a box that every business operates by. And so there's a language you have to learn. You have to know accounting, you have to know some level of finance, but living within that box and kind of getting you to be like a management consultant is hard while you're also trying to pursue a company, right? Yeah. And so you're kind of breaking all the rules at the same time you're learning them. Yeah, yeah, totally. You're going against everybody. And in some way, like you're kind of an oddball, but people kind of admire you at the same time because they're like, oh, wow, you're doing a product or something. And you also have a yeah. litmus test, like you can test your product on a on your whole cohort which is yeah. really nice. Well, I was on the weird side, I think. Okay. Like, well, so so I say that because yes, I totally agree. Like, and I think that's why I had this assumption, okay, I wanna get into food. I, I, I think food is this amazing changing space and it's changing for the better, right? So then you like, you talk to your advisors at business school and they're like, okay, well, great. Like go get your feet wet at General Mills and then you'll have all the experience you need to do whatever you want later on. So like that's, mm -hmm. That's the normal quote unquote path, I guess. And then I, I guess I went out of the box and was like, okay, I want to do this. And, you know, started going to the store and buying tons of herbs and brewing them in a communal dorm kitchen. And that's wow. the part where people are like, do you really know what you're doing? You know, you're like head over a pot on the stove, like clogging the sink with cardamom pods, you know, a month before graduating business school. And people are like, is this, is this really like what you want to do? So I, yeah, I think there's, there's definitely a little bit of both. And so people know too, I mean, getting a job at General Mills or one of these big consumer packaged good companies is actually quite amazing because you're literally, while you're at these companies, and I'm just saying this because a lot of people don't know this, while you're at these companies, you're literally developing new products. And I give people the example of like Tide Pods, right? And so if you think about just something as simple as detergent and how yeah. many forms it's taken to the point of Tide Pods, it's like MBAs or people, you know, from business schools across the country and different different teams come together to pitch these products. And if you're on one of those things, one of those teams that let's say the idea was the Tide Pod, one, you you see a whole journey, right? Of an idea to market to, and so that experience can be super invaluable uh, to starting anything later. So you have, I imagine enough, of, like you're testing different recipes and you you, you nail it at some point and then What's the leap of faith? What do you, are you done with business school when you say, you know, let's go make okay, this a well, company? To be fair, I really didn't nail it. So this is okay. kind of, fun. I think like starting a company is like, it's this mix of, you have this, this passion, this desire to do it. Right. It's, it's, I think part driven by the, the need and part like your own personal journey. Something's calling you to do that. And then you have to have like a healthy dose of naivety. Right. Cause you really have no clue what's about to come at you. And I, I say that jokingly. So I was like, okay, this is the concept for Sunwing. It's going to be all about like plant powered wellness. How do we make herbs easy, accessible for people? And then I moved out to the Bay area right after I graduated with effectively like some bottles of liquid and was like, okay, I'm going to get this made and, and test it out. And I'm going to do it on a really small scale to truly understand like, you know, what's going to work, what are people going to respond well to? And I think that that sentiment came from a lot of advice I got from investors, from entrepreneurs that were, you know, all said, Hey, if you're going to carve out a new, a new space, a new category, like it's challenging and you need to figure out what works before you, you go in really, really deep. And so moved out to the Bay area in 2017 and launched the product in 2018 and drove it around in my Honda fit to grocery stores and did the in-store demos and you know, did the distribution and from that process learned the first product was horrible. <laughs> and, and I think like it was just way too medicinal. It was way too intense. And so I you know, went back to the drawing board and reformulated, re-looked at the packaging, right? Like the, the beautiful blue packaging that is Sunwing's brand today all came out of those learnings. Like it has to pop on shelf. It has to be delicious as well as functional. And so the punchline of 2018 is the product you see today. And that's what we launched at the beginning of 2019. And that's when things really took off. But it took a like a really hard, quite literal, like heavy lifting year of, of learning to, to get to that point. 
Yeah, I, I, I tell what I think this is like one thing I actually learned in business school was like you end up doing a lot of surveys and stuff. And it's like um, whenever you have a product, everybody knows you have buy like, you know what you like. But once you make something that you like, it's a completely different experience to go to these grocery stores and say, hey, taste this, taste this. And which the data you're going to collect is usually so different than what, you, <laughs> you know, like what your own personal preferences are, even in terms of branding, in terms of like what colors appeal to people and blah, blah, blah. Can you show everybody just, I know you have a bottle of it there. I'd love for people to see it. Cause I think it's like super beautiful. This is the bottle. Yeah. And this, I mean, again, like this came from a lot of learning over 2018 about like, Hey, the beverage space is super competitive. The wellness space is super competitive. And, and like the brand that we're trying to build is this one of accessibility and cheerfulness and inclusiveness. And like, how do we get the packaging to convey that? And you know, I didn't have a lot of funding in the beginning. So like we didn't have a ton of money to spend on, you know, an agency. This, the idea for the blue bottle came from me sitting at bars, you know, when I was probably supposed to be talking to my friends, looking at spirits on the shelf and being like, wow, those bottles are really beautiful. How do I bring that alive or bring that to life? So, you know, it was, it was scrappy in the beginning. That's really fascinating because in some way you have to educate the market as well. Right. And so the way I think about when brands roll out packaging, it's like you have to pick one. Either you're picking something that grabs them. So if it's pretty or if it looks appealing or if it just pops, let's say it just pops on the shelf, then you've hooked me. But yeah. then you, there's another layer of it where, and this is really interesting because brands can literally decide how they decide to attack the market. And so is it education first? Is it hook them with the product first, have them taste it? And now the education sinks in. Um, especially I think from probably where you were coming from when maybe you were a little bit early to market, let's say, or an early mover in this specific category, right? Do, do, do you see it the same way? Yeah, I think, and again, this came from a lot of learning, but, but one of the things that we've tr really tried to make easy for people is like, you know, the blue is going to pull you in and the names of the flavors, which is arguably the only other thing you'll probably see because you spend all of one second, two seconds, right? Looking is going to be very easy for you to understand. So like, it's going to be detox ginger, right? You probably know what detox means and you probably have an experience with ginger. And then hopefully you enjoy the product from a taste perspective for how it makes you feel. And then as you're, you're digging in further and especially for the consumer that that really does understand the herbs, you're turning it over and you're like, wow, you know, this product is incredibly clean and they use dandelion root and they use burdock root. Like, I wonder what those things are. And if you want to go into that depth as a consumer, like the information, and I think the credibility is there from the Sunwing perspective, like we work with herbalists to craft each blend, right? Like there's a lot of information on our website about those herbs, but we try not to throw it all at you at once because we recognize that one is probably not going to get your attention and two, it can feel intimidating, right? So like start with the beautiful packaging, a simple name and great taste, and then go from there. And then at the grocery store. So if I'm in like, there's, a, there's about an ear one super close to where I live here in Los Angeles. If I'm at ear one where I imagine you guys are by the kombuchas, right? And so did that sort of set your price point or, or were you always like, how did you think about at least getting to what, what price point was going to work for the business? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. I mean, I think there's, there's definitely, especially if you go into retail and, and really anywhere, like people are very, everyone's buying beverages all the time, right? Like we all have like six, seven, eight drinking consumption moments a day. And so we're all pretty aware of what our coffee costs and what our kombucha costs, et cetera. So you have to be really mindful of price from that perspective. There's, there's a ceiling. But I think as we think about Sunwing, again, we, have, we really care about accessibility. And so we basically keep the price as low as we possibly can while still being in business. And I, I think that, you know, we hear that like sometimes we have brought the product to certain places and they're like, okay, so this is probably like $10, you know, and, and they're surprised that, that it's only, you know, $3.99 for one of the tonics. And that's good. Like, I, I want you to feel like you're getting a really high quality, beautiful product, but we want it to be accessible. Yeah. And I imagine just when you were first rolling this out, I imagine you're doing a bunch of taste tests at these grocery stores and then these these things are growing. What has COVID-19 been like since all that's shut down, right? There's no more tastings, but it's still on the shelf. And so we have 
all the other co companies we've had on the podcast, a lot of them just lean so heavily into social media education. And so yeah. it's like they said, you know, our supply chain is shot. People at the grocery store, but we can't we can't connect with them. And so they've just completely moved uh, not not to say away from influencers, but toward influencers that are that understand the makeup of the product, the the natural ingredients, let's say. And so what has this time been like for for you and the company? Yeah, I mean, COVID has thankfully for for our employees, everyone's remained healthy and like that above all is has been great. And I think we've been able to grow stronger culturally as a company as well. But I mean, don't get me wrong in the beginning, it was terrifying. Like we had a, a lot of business and food service, right? Your cafes, your coffee shops, and that disappeared overnight. And for a brand in hyper growth, that's really scary. But I think and you do learn this in business school. So it's interesting to see this play out. I think it also made us stronger as a business because we doubled down on our, our own website, our own e-commerce channel, and we're able to grow in a way we, we couldn't have never expected. I think that fast and it's opened up incredible opportunity for us. So, you know, we think of ourselves as an omni-channel brand. We have strong distribution in retail, especially in the natural channel, and then growth through our own website and a lot of big expansion plans for 2021. But I think, you know, in the first 90 days that COVID hit, like George and my co-founder and I sat down and we, we put together like a very in-depth kind of action plan for how we were going to think about this, the business and like what needed to happen. Everything from calling like our supply chain, everyone in our supply chain weekly to make sure like that wasn't impacted to getting e-commerce up and going to saying like, how do we support a positive team culture when we're not going to see each other? And I think that that sentiment has has continued. I know a lot of companies have like hired wellness coaches or, or mindfulness coaches, and they're doing like things remote as a team or just like one-on-one, -on -one, but it's totally up to the employees just because of the disconnect. And obviously like we're all at home, but if you have kids and a dog, it's like, it's, a, it's quite, it's like a zoo, right? You're like trying to work while there's like a zoo and madness around you. And so it's very difficult for, are you guys, did you guys have an office in San Francisco? Were you guys always remote? Are you remote now? Yeah, so we had an office in San Francisco and, you know, the team has grown from six to 13 people in, it grew from six to 13 people in 2020. And so we we did make hires during COVID where I've never met the people in person. And so, yeah, we really had to think about culture and, and like, how do we set up organic touch points? So like we have, it's kind of dorky, but it works. We have team meetings. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, that are purely just touch points for us to all come together. And Mondays we do gratitudes where people just go around and say something they're grateful for. And we do fabulous failures, which is an optional thing, but you can be like, here's something that went horribly wrong. And on Wednesdays, our VP of ops who's awesome, leaves us in a meditation. And then on Fridays, we call them fun Fridays, but it's like, choose your own adventure. We've done everything from like learn different TikTok dances to <laughs> we played categories. It's like really, but it, it, it gets a laugh, you know, and it's a place where, um, you know, people can just, can just hang out. And, and I think that's been important. Yeah, no, those things are super important. I love the creativity of all those things. That's so yeah. great. Have you thought about, and I, I'm just saying, I have a lot of friends at San Francisco who have all like, they've all moved and two camps, right? There's one camp that says I'm moving and I'll come back once my office is open again. And then there's another camp just saying I'm moving. And like some CEOs I know have moved their entire companies to, to New York or to just the other, to Florida, as an example, have you thought about any of that? I know it's a hard decision, but have like, wh where is your mind at as, as the San Francisco exodus kind of reaps into the headlines? Yeah. I mean, I, I think, we think of San Francisco as our home. I think this city is beautiful and has so much to offer. So, you know, for the time being, this will this will continue to be our home. The one thing and the very cool thing that I think COVID has allowed is we've just been more open to remote hiring, right? And so that used to just be from like a sales side, right? You'd be like, okay, we need sales reps in New York City for very obvious reasons, but now it's really opened up, I think, our ability to hire marketing and ops people around the country. And one, I think it makes us way more in touch with like the, our community as a whole. And we meet really cool people that way. So, you know, we just hired an awesome community manager who manages all of our social and she lives in Atlanta. And 
probably will never move to the Bay Area. And that's been a great push for us. That's awesome. Yeah, we're kind of in the same boat. It's it's a COVID, it's this opportunity too, where there's so much tremendous, amazing talent on the market. And so if you can hire, if you're in a position to hire, you can get some like really amazing people all across the country. And obviously we're all learning how to work remote or some, you know, some of us probably have been doing it for a long time, but it's a good opportunity to to capture some amazing talent that's out there. Yeah. And it's like, it's another touch point where you just, it pushes you to question things you thought had to be true. Right. Right. Like we, you know, it's like another example, we thought we wouldn't hire people remote or we thought we wouldn't do e-commerce in this capacity until like 2022. And like, you just challenge your assumptions and you're better for it. My company, we, we went through the company I was with, we went through Y Combinator and there's this big emphasis of like creating culture. Right. And so they don't want you hanging out at the offices. They want you and your team of like, usually at that point, it's like two to four people, sometimes yeah. more, but you, it's a small team. And so like, we're all living together and they and they place a big emphasis on culture and like building the culture and getting to like, which naturally as you, as you grow, you're thinking like, okay, I'm going to get to 20 employees. Everyone to your point can't be remote because how do I build culture if we're remote? And I never really agreed with it. I was like, this kind of becomes limiting at some point, especially because it's not like an office is free, right? It's like, these things are very expensive. Having right. people come in can be kind of tough. And so it just get it becomes hard. And so I'm like, I'm kind of happy all of this happened because in some way it's like, we can all work remote and it's just, we just need to do things a little bit differently to get there. Where are you guys at in terms of raising capital? Are you, have, are you raising? Did you already raise pre-COVID or what does that look like from just a growth standpoint? Yeah, you know, we don't disclose kind of the details of it, but, but you know, we, we have raised funding. I think it's definitely something that, you know, you can learn as much about the strategy in business school, but I think, you know, that what happens when you're, when you're really out there is you learn at rapid, rapid speed and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it, it takes up way more time than I think you ever thought it was going to be. And I also think it's provided like incredible growth opportunities for myself and for my co-founder. Um, and, and look like, unfortunately for solo female founded companies, like, you know, there's just not as much funding historically that has gone to those teams. And so it's, it's been exciting to, I think, be part of that change and, you know, to speak to other female entrepreneurs that are, that are starting out and and help provide some guidance to, you know, share our story and, and hopefully help them up as, as, they're going through the same same steps. It's so true. My, my wife also owns her own business and uh, like we're, you know, we're in the process of maybe having children. And so we're like, she's, you know, I think one thing a lot of women deal with is what happens when, I, when I'm pregnant. And so I, I ended up talking to a founder, this was about a year ago and she was pregnant. And so I, and she was raising capital. She's like, Diego, imagine being pregnant and raising capital, like not fun, right? Yeah. And I was like, I don't even, I can't even begin to imagine what that's like, but I asked her like, what is that like for you? And, and is it terrifying? Cause you know, not only are you raising capital now, but you know, you're going to take a leave or hopefully take some time off when, when the baby's delivered. And her whole thing was like, I'm just so happy. I hired the right people because Mm -hmm. that means I can leave and be totally okay. And I just thought that's the perfect answer. Like, that's it. Like hire the right team. Yeah. And so you're just doing your check-ins, you know, while taking care of your baby, but you have the right system in place. And I was just so happy that she came out with that too. Cause I know that answer is super yeah. personal to people and it's not talked about enough. We, you know, on our show, we've, we've probably interviewed more female founders Yeah. and as a male, it's hard for me because it's like, there are actually like my wife has a lot, like I see it every day. I see what, what the, you know, the trouble spots are, but yeah. It's like, I think we just need to open up about some of these hardships a little bit more because yeah. there's so many. And and I think it can feel nerve wracking, right? I Like, I don't have kids, but you know, there, there is of course that question, right? Like, will, will that be held against me? Right. Is that what's not, what, what's not said in the room? Like, uh oh, like she just got married. What does that mean? <laughs> yeah. Um, you hope that wouldn't be true, but yeah, I mean, I think it's more been on, we've definitely gotten more of the, hey, beverage is pretty male dominated. We've gotten comments like, I just don't know if you or your team are tough enough, which has been sort of like eye popping, like, wow, I can't believe somebody would say that. But, you know, I, I think 
like one of the things that I have learned through the process and, and I always share with people is like having a strong group of, of advisors and mentors is invaluable. So that's thing one, you know, like you can really build, like building out that support system is super helpful in the process. And I think the other thing is like sticking to your guns and knowing your worth, right? Yeah. Um, stick to your guns anymore but like knowing your <laughs> worth right like know know that you're worth the same valuation as like your male counterparts are getting at that that level that you're at and holding true to that that is really powerful and that's one of the things that i think has been a learning curve for me there's a great tweet out there so there's this uh i think she's based in san francisco too so she i forget her name she's a she's an author writer big big time in the startup space and also like does does coaching specifically yeah. for female founders and she goes here's all i do Female says to me, hey, what should I charge? I respond with double what you think, the end. And I just retweeted it being like, yes, like this is exactly what I tell my wife. You know, it's the same thing. And I, I'm well, like, women devalue themselves right out of the gate. And I just don't know why. And I think it's because they're so nice. Like you're, women really look at the holistic approach. And so whenever they're giving something to a client, they're thinking about the client way more than men do. And I'm saying this honestly, like I don't, men just think about like, I'm going to make this much money. Women think about, I'm going to make some, but you know, this client has, and they just, they just do an analysis that's very human and honest. And sometimes it doesn't, it doesn't work out in the capitalistic world all the way, all the time. Yeah. And I, I think one of the other things that my co-founder Jordan and I talk a lot about, you know, I, I think bettering ourselves, or this is something I've, I've think I've gotten better with. And I, I share this, if I'm ever talking to a, a new female entrepreneur is you don't always have to answer the question. You know, sometimes when you're like vendors, potential investors, like people want access to a lot of information. And I think there's a sentiment that I grew up with, which was kind of like, do your homework and have the right answer and always have it ready and, you know, raise your hand. And I think if it's information you don't want to give at that point, because it's like you're in the negotiation, right? You you don't can say like, I'm not comfortable giving that answer right now. Or like, I'm happy to share that, but I'm going to share it with you in a month or whatever that answer is. And I think holding your ground and knowing that that's valid and you don't have this responsibility to like do your homework for everybody else, like you can be strong and hold your ground. That's a valuable lesson as well. That's a big tip. I know, like what you're saying is actually a really big tip and I hope people really latch onto it because it's so true. I'm just thinking about my wife. So my wife is a female general contractor. So she owns her own construction company, right? And so she's already in like a male dominated world. And for her, she feels like she has to be so much better, sharper. And yeah. that naturally lends itself to you wanting or needing to have all the answers. Yeah. Right. Yeah. When, when to what you're saying is really powerful and like you don't have to, and that's okay. And I think that's or you may not that's want to, I, or you may not want to, right? You know, like, I think that's the other thing, right? Yeah, like you have you have agency, you have choice there. The that's power good stuff. Of <laughs> that's cool what your wife does. Yeah, yeah, no, she's she's a badass. Uh, let's talk about <laughs> let's talk about your product a little bit more. What in terms of ingredients? So I'd read a little bit about it. All natural. What does that mean specifically? You know, things are branded all natural, but aren't always all natural. Let's talk a little bit about what you guys put in your product. Yeah, all natural is a tough, a tough one. I, so I guess this, you can see this, but like, this is our ingredient list right here. And, and it's, it's a list, right? It's not like that paragraph ingredient thing where you're like squinting your eyes and, you know, what's in this and that in a nutshell is the philosophy, right? So like this flavor is lemon rose uplift. It's sparkling water, a little bit of maple syrup, lemon juice to preserve it and salt and then then it's the herbs and that's it. Why is that so different in beverage? Well, most beverages, even the quote unquote kind of all natural world, they have citric acid to preserve it. You know, we've stayed away from even like plant-based alternative sweeteners that are zero calorie, like a stevia or a monk fruit. We, we still don't use those. That was very feedback driven for us. We got a lot of feedback from consumers saying they really didn't want those, those fake sweeteners. And so that on one level is I think the cleanness, but I think the, the other thing that's really important for Sunwink and for me personally is like, I was personally inspired by the herbalist community and it's really important that that is a continued part of Sunwink's story. So we actually have like an equity advisor that's an herbalist that we talk to on every blend and, and we say, you know, how do you think about these herbs and the herbs we're using and how much we're using? And we get really great feedback, whether it's 
hey, you know, this herb is endangered and I really wouldn't use it in a product that's going to go mass, or I wouldn't put these two herbs together, or I wouldn't use this herb in something you would tell people like is cool to consume every day. And these people, the herbalists, I think are, are often not brought into that narrative. Um, and it's really important. They study this. I think it's really important they're brought into the narrative. And the other thing I'll say is each Sunwing product is also inspired by a person and their story. Um, and that's really like what the brand's all about. So every flavor is inspired by a real human and then they pick um, an organization that they want 2% of our net sales to go to. So it started really small, like the turmeric recovery flavor is my mother-in-law. But now as we've gotten bigger and as we continue to put out new products, they'll all be inspired by people that we think have a real powerful point of view and culture. And we want to help to amplify that and, and want to give them a place where they can give back to an organization they believe in. That's amazing. That's really so cool. those are like the layers. It's like, okay, yes, these are the ingredients and they're super clean, but like there's much more, I think, depth to the stories that you might not get on the first sip, but really, really important, I think, to, to us as a brand. So as you grow, at some point you have probably three flavors you go to market with, but how do you evolve? And so there's um, someone I spoke to here in LA that they're making herbal beer, right? And so they're just letting everything sit together for a little bit longer, almost like a kombucha, but it's, yeah. it's like really beautiful. Yeah, and same thing, they have an herbalist on board and it's like very thoughtful. But as you guys think about growing the company, I'm sure this v a VCs ask this question all the time, right? It's like, okay, okay, Eliza, you have three great products, sales look good, retail locations look amazing, but how are you guys gonna build the next widget? How do you view that growth is it different flavors? Is it different products? Um, what does that look like for you? Yeah, I would say it's both. I mean, we view Sunwink as a plant powered wellness brand and we view it as a platform, right? So like it's, it's going to be able to hold different product lines that have herbs and superfoods in them. So they're not all gonna be sparkling tonics. We actually have some really exciting things that I can't disclose here, but are on the horizon in 2021 that are, there are other products that have herbs and superfoods and they come in different shapes and sizes with, with different ways to use them. So I think, you know, again, our vision is that you're using these kinds of products in a lot of your meal occasions throughout the day. And there's different ways to do that. And Caitlin mentioned to us, you're releasing something next week. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is this, is this the time you're telling us is we release it after? <laughs> Okay, then that's perfect. So I can tell you, um, yeah. So we're we're launching superfood powders, and they're so cool. I'm so excited because I I make these on my own. So I'll just use one flavor as an example. We have a cacao clarity flavor, and you can put it in your coffee. You can mix it in like an amazing kind of like nut milk, warm nut milk blend and it makes like a healthy hot chocolate. You can pop it in smoothies. It's really a choose your own adventure. You can even put it in brownie recipes. And, you know, we have a, we have another one that's launching called, called Berry Calm, which is near and dear to my heart. You know, again, this one is all about calmness in your body. And, and for me, that's a big thing. I deal with a lot of stress. So, you know, it has reishi and ashwagandha and lemon balm um, and it, like a beautiful blueberry hibiscus flavor. And it, so good in like yogurt or a smoothie, but like you can also just pop it in hot water. Again, super easy to use, incredibly clean and and um, like a celebration of the the superfoods and herbs. So I'm just envisioning this. If I see it at the store, is it, uh, is it like a box of packets, almost like tea bags that I'm buying or is it gonna be individual it's, uh, it's packets? It's like a carton, it's in a tin. Um, okay. so not single serve, you can like pop your spoon okay. in a lot of spoonful and, and put it when, in whatever you want. Got it. That's super exciting. Uh, I know one of the hard parts of, of launching a product like this is like, where does it go in the grocery store? And <laughs> can you share a little bit about where they're going to, or where have they, they've decided? And I'm sure this is still being figured out maybe, but where, where does it look like it'll be placed? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, this is of course why your own website is always a little easier because you eliminate yeah. the merchandising, <laughs> the merchandising question. But, um, yeah, I mean, there's Whole Foods as an example. Whole Foods has what they call the whole body section, right? Mm -hmm. So you can buy anything from collagen to powdered greens to soap there, right? And and that's the section where something like this would live. Got it. Yeah. Awesome. And are yeah. there any new like 
just for people listening, tell everyone where they can find your product. I know I'm sure you're in a variety of outlets, but where can they go ahead and, and purchase Sunwink? Yeah, so obviously on our website and the powders will also be available on Amazon. And then we have a, a pretty strong hold in kind of the natural grocery space. So Whole Foods, natural grocers, um, and we have a few really exciting retail launches coming this year, which again, I'm not allowed to disclose, but they're coming. So just keep checking our website for the fun of us. I always like asking this because it's a bit of a marketing play and it's a, it's a hard question, but do you ever envision yourselves having like your own retail location? So whether maybe it's like a small 500 square foot, something on like a busy road that at least gets people an understanding of your brand. Maybe they're doing some tastings and it's kind of a way to introduce your product. Does this ever come up in discussion from a strategy perspective? I know it like doesn't pencil and it's kind of hard to get the ROI. It's really a marketing play, but sometimes I think like when you have a cool brand, it, it, it really can connect people to, you know, what they see in the grocery store in a, in a totally different way. No, I love that. I, I, it's funny you bring that up. Some, uh, we just had an investor who was talking to us about that today. It's a great idea. And I would say like, it's not happening next month, but never say never. But yeah, I mean, these, these moments where you, you create physical spaces for people to come together, I, there's such great storytelling moments, right? So all of that, all those things I was talking about, like highlighting the different people behind the, the drinks, highlighting the herbalists, like those are places where you can really bring that to life. Yeah, I can just envision it. It's like a big green space. Maybe there's herbs everywhere and then people can kind of connect to it in a different in a different way. Um, that isn't yeah. so obvious, I think. Well, and herbs and plants are so like I mean, they are they're healing just being around them, right? And it's it's so fun to experience them. Like I would love for people to come in and you could be like, Okay, like this is a lemon bomb tincture. Like, do you wanna try it? Like, see how it makes you feel. Like there, there is a huge experience um, and teaching moment that I think comes to life when you're physically together. And like, we all have had that experience of being around plants and, and having them be healing for us. I can see this on Union Street in San Francisco. Like I can, I can like see it, you know, around kind of around the Equinox right there, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it makes a lot of sense. Well, listen, Tell everyone where they can find you, where they can support outside of your website. I know you guys have a beautiful Instagram. Just share a little bit about where people can can connect with the brand. Yeah, I, I mean, we love to hear from consumers. I think whether it's through our DMs, through finding us on our website, through celebrating us in Whole Foods, we always appreciate a good shout out to, to someone you see in the grocery store. They work hard to stock the shelves, so... You know, there you can you can obviously buy it that way, but um, you know we we love to hear you from you through through email, Instagram, all that good stuff. So, awesome. Well, listen, thanks so much for coming on the podcast and sharing your launch and a little bit about Sunwink. So go check them out. Thank you guys so much. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Have a great rest of your day.